When a couple speaks their vows and consummates their vows with sexual union, it is not man, woman, pastor, parent who's the main actor. God is. God joins a husband and a wife in one flesh. God does that. God does that. From which Jesus draws the awesome conclusion, what God has joined, no man may separate. Marriage is God's doing because it is a one flesh union that God himself performs. That was an audio clip by prominent Baptist pastor John Piper, best known for his thorough exegetical defense of Calvinism, his epic theological battle with N.T. Wright over the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, boring, as well as his best-selling works like The Passion of the Christ and Don't Waste Your Life. Brady and I used to argue about this guy constantly in college. Piper is a passionate speaker and a very, very dogmatic thinker. He's known in certain sects of Christianity as someone who is unapologetic about what the Bible teaches. He tells it like it is, even if it's not popular, even if it's hard to swallow. Piper is the guy that will say it. And this makes him somewhat of a hero for certain Christians. And it makes sense. If the Bible is truth with a capital T, and it says X, then X must be true, and it must be important if it made the cut. So why would anyone beat around the bush? I wanted to start off the show with that particular clip for a specific reason. Try to keep it in the back of your mind as we navigate today's episode. Piper is very sure of himself here. He repeats the phrase, God did it, several times. And as I'm editing the audio, I can see that he's overdriving the microphone when he says it. And the thing is, if the Bible is actually true, I don't think he's wrong. I think he's making a pretty accurate, straightforward statement about what the Bible teaches about marriage. Whether it's the way God creates Eve out of the flesh of Adam's side, or the statement that Jesus made in Mark that you always hear at the end of wedding ceremonies. Who God has joined together, let no one separate. Matthew, you may now kiss your bride. Marriage seems to be something God does, at least in the biblical narrative. And for a lot of couples, I think that's a comforting proposition. But what about when things go terribly, terribly wrong? Sometimes there is this very dark, very sinister, even evil side to marriage. Does God do that too? What if your health, safety, or, or even your life is being threatened by your marriage? Is it okay to separate then? Does the Bible even address that? In this week's episode, we're interviewing our friend Ashley a very strong, intense, resilient human who will share her story of learning her own tremendous self-worth. We want to warn our listeners that toward the end of the episode, we will be addressing the issue of domestic abuse. We don't get into explicit descriptions, any particular events, but the subject matter may still be triggering for some listeners. But as always, we hope that this story builds us all up and helps us heal as we navigate each other's pain. I'm Chuck Parson. You're listening to The Life After. Chuck, welcome back to another week of the life after. I'm back. We we since yeah. we're both always here. I, know, I was about to say that's kind of weird to say that you're back. And anyway, welcome, um, Ashley. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hey. hey Ashley. Um, okay, Ashley. We grew up in the same church, and that church was a little. We had a very unique experience in that church. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Because I listened to a lot of kids that grew up in our area and, uh, you know, they're like, oh yeah, we played sports. We did this or that. What did we do? When I try to explain what my life was like when I went to church, 
all the time growing up in a youth group, junior high and high school. Uh huh. Most people don't even. It doesn't register. Understand? Yeah. It does what I'm talking just, about. It's just like like blank stares, right? Right. Um. Okay, so we we grew up in a mega church. It was pretty big, even for like where we came from. We came from Arnold, Missouri, like about two thousand people, or twenty thousand, excuse me. And the church literally was two thousands when we were there, around there. Ten percent of Arnold went to your church, <laughs> basically, right? Well, I mean, like, people from like other like little one townships out of every come... ten people. In Arnold. <laughs> and compared to other churches in the area, so how you many know? how many yeah. meth dealers were in? Your... <laughs> So, uh, uh, I understand that you guys got along really well back then. (laughs) Um, Ashley, do you want to take this one? (laughs) (laughs) So, we were always at all the same activities, all the same events, Mm -hmm. pretty much at the same time. We have, like, the same memories, but not of us actually, like, interacting together. Uh <laughs> he so was actually a really friends close. with a lot of my friends, but me and him weren't friends. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the where was what was the tension there? What was that about? Ashley, <laughs> Brady was pretty annoying, actually. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Here we go. I'm, just I'm agreeing with you 100. There it is. <laughs> uh, how was I? How am or was I annoying? <laughs> Um, I, I think, I think back then I had always kind of wanted us to get along a little bit better and get to know each other better, Mm -hmm. but it was really, really hard to kind of get to know the real you and you always had so much going on and you were doing so much and talking to everybody and sort of being in all of the different circles that even, even before we got to the youth group, and especially in our youth group, I always kind of felt like I didn't fit in. Uh, you were always supposed to act a certain way and, and be a certain uh, way. Unpack that a little bit, because you, you mentioned a few, a few things in your, in your notes that um, I think are, are pretty pertinent, right? So in what ways were you different? What were you, you know... So as a teenager, you're already going through this like very emotional time and starting junior high and it's like such a big deal. And at the same time, it was like going into youth group and I sort of had this idea that I would just have these close friends and that we would do all this fun stuff and that it would be just the greatest experience Mm -hmm, ever. mm -hmm. And then it like really didn't happen. Uh, It's true. Mm -hmm. I was very awkward. Um, I was very quiet. I, I think what it... (laughs) what it was is I was very self-conscious and just didn't have the confidence just to be myself. Mm -hmm. And so I was always doubting myself and just trying Mm -hmm. to um, read sort of the social context or the atmosphere to get a read on what people were, were thinking about me and how they perceived Mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And the messages that I was always receiving is that I was just the weird one that didn't fit in. Right. Exactly. And so it was really hard because I felt that way at school, but then I went to a public school. Um, part of that was kind of kind of expected because school was supposed to be rough at that age. Mm-hmm. But at church, it was sort of this mindset like, okay, this is the one place that I have where I can really be myself and have people who are really going to accept me. And then when that didn't happen, it really mm-hmm. made a huge impact on me mm-hmm. at wow. that age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it kind of sounds to me like you and Brady were dealing with the same thing in just very, very different ways. There is right? so right. much truth in that. And I mean, that's, that's everybody in middle school, high school. Right. right? Yeah. You know, we're all like, very ah, emotional. I hate myself. <laughs> and then we all act out in really unhealthy ways to cope, you know? Yeah. Uh, but you also like you were you were also dealing with some like sort of undiagnosed anxiety depression right I mean is that that's right I didn't realize that that's what was happening at the time mm-hmm. but I actually had really bad social anxiety uh-huh. and it would happen in social situations like outside of church as well like with school or with friends and stuff but for some reason whenever I was in church, I think is because it was already such an emotional experience and we had the worship service and we had the music and we had everything. Um, I, I mean, I guess if any, any kind of emotionally heightened experience was, was sort of like your anxiety would, would be like, 
heightened, right? Right. That would happen. And it, it like ha- you said, you would leave during worship services because right. you would be having. Like, I panic I would attack. break down crying a lot, but then that was that was kind of the thing to do because you were supposed to you know express you know how moved you were by you know raising your hands or mm-hmm. crying or, or going and praying in front of um, the altar. And that was like a big that. thing with our church. I realized that's not universal with everybody's experience. Did you know that? Just like how often we'd go down to the altar and pray and everything. That's well, not like I a, would all the time. And it wasn't like everyone in our youth group did. <laughs> yeah, I was I was one who would pretty often. Right. Um, and I just, yeah, I felt like I had to. I felt like I had so much emotion going on that I just had to let it out. And then I would have so much anxiety in those moments that I would actually physically leave the church service and have to find a place that was solitary and private on my own. And uh, I would pray and journal and try to deal with the emotions that I was, I was experiencing. So what, what, uh, I mean, you guys mentioned altar calls. So was this like a, was this like a personal sort of like, I have this sin that I need to deal with, or was it like more of a general, like, oh, I like just anxiety and then you're trying to sort it out or, you know what I mean? Like it, when you're going off by yourself, oh, oh, hey. what are you journaling about? So it was mostly crying. It was mostly asking God to help me not be so emotionally vulnerable mm-hmm. and to be mm-hmm. more like everyone else who was able to just go and sing the songs and listen to the sermon and not have this huge emotional reaction. So a a lot of that is just praying and and asking God, you know, I don't know why I'm like this. I don't know what's happening. Um, I I really didn't understand. I felt very, very, very misunderstood. Like there was something wrong with me. Right. So you were aware that you were, you were different, right? Right. You were, you were like painfully aware that you were reacting differently emotionally than the the people around you. Right. So if it makes you feel any better at the same time, I was like probably a couple feet away from you crying because I realized I was gay. You know, like in junior high, thinking there was something wrong with me and right. all the same stuff. This is happening at the same time. Right. Yeah. Right. We just, yeah, yeah. neither of us had any clue that we were going through this stuff because we didn't Well, I always it. thought it was interesting because then I would like wipe my tears and then go back and time it so that I walked back into the church when everybody else was done and standing up and walking out and nobody would, would like notice. asked like, what happened? Where did you go? Right, 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 right. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what I'm getting at is like. Uh, I don't know if it, I mean, in your particular environment, I don't know if you were being stigmatized and it was like, nobody really knew what to do with you or if it was more like just ignorance, like, Oh, she's just, she's just going to have her time with God. You know what I mean? Like, but there was this lack of awareness that there was a problem that sort of needed to be confronted. Right. I mean, would you agree with that? Right. I didn't realize that I was very, very lonely and feeling mm-hmm. like I didn't have any support system and that I didn't have any friends and that I was dealing with emotions and didn't have anyone to help me. And that was sort of my coping mechanism, mm-hmm. I guess you could say. But it was so weird. And I remember thinking, you know, this is not normal. There's something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. And looking back on that, it's like, oh, my gosh, I was having anxiety attacks. Right. And right. I didn't even realize that that's what was happening to where you're just so overwhelmed that you feel you you physically like feel in your body like I have to get out of this situation. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's uh, I feel like what you're saying is that you and you you basically said this earlier, right? So like the, like church was somewhere that you were hoping would be a safe place, be it socially, like oh I'll have all these friends if I go to youth group, right? And that didn't work out. And then like you have you're dealing with this anxiety which you can't you have you don't have a name for it's just a, a a thing that you're dealing with and you're trying to ask god about it but god's never very specific about these things he's not going to like point you to the dsm or anything <laughs> so um yeah so uh so you're not like the church is not it's not only not helping you it's it's almost like this big empty space right where you're triggered um, and you ha- you're having these panic attacks and then you're like dealing with it on your own and then you're r- coming back into this quote unquote community and, and nobody's like really reaching out to you. And that- 
I always felt that I had to hide it. I did have some a uh, few girls that I was very very close with and were very supportive to me, mm-hmm. but even with them, I felt like I couldn't tell them that this was happening or that I was feeling sad and just lonely just all the time, like going through this depression and having this anxiety in these moments um, that I couldn't control. Um, And I think a lot of it is because I, my personality was such a people pleaser. Like I always just wanted people to really like me. And so I was really afraid of rejection if I were to tell them, hey, this is what's going on instead of being the way that I'm supposed to act as a, you know, a good Christian right. and all of this that, you know, I'm having all of these problems. Yeah. 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 There's this, there's this, you're supposed to be a certain way. You're supposed to act a certain way. This is like very pervasive in church culture. Christianity makes you happy. So be happy. Right. And how are people, how are we going to convince people that this is true? How are we going to convince ourselves that this is true? If you're not happy, right? Like, that's a problem. That's a problem with our worldview. God came so that we could all have life and have, or Jesus came so we could all have life and have it to the full. But you don't have it to the full. What are you doing wrong, right? I remember in our church, too, we, there was this attitude of, well, I'm too, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Uh-huh. Or there's this idea that you would go to your work, you'd go to your school, and you'd be happy. And then people would be like, why are you so happy? And you're like, oh, well, let me tell you. You know, it's because right. I asked Jesus, you know, what I mean? and so it's kind of like this. There isn't room to experience like 90% of human emotions, right? Right. Especially if you're experiencing those, that other 90%, 90% of the time, you know? But you're doing like it for other people. Like you feel that if I'm not happy, then other people may not be interested in, in joining my religion. And if they're not going to join my religion, they would go to hell. So there was like so much weight put on pressure. putting on this. Yeah. persona it felt to, like to be to pretend to be happy for or, sure yeah for me i felt like i had to pretend if i yeah. wasn't happy i had to act like i was happy and it was kind of a fake it till you make it type of thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that the happiness would come if i would just pretend right right so i feel like the the issue the issue for me is that and i don't want to be unfair to the church right because right. human the human race in general right now is having a really hard time dealing with mental illness it's something we're just learning about psychology is relatively new and we're trying to destigmatize mental illness we're trying to uh like learn appropriate paths to deal with it right and that's something that we're still in the the groundwork of researching you know we hardly understand it at all but um, it's also like the, the, my problem is that the church is that religion claims to have answers for, the, for, this, for these problems, right? Anxiety, depression, or, uh, you know, in all sorts of, you know, mental illnesses. This is, that Jesus is supposed to be the, the answer the to answer that, the response, the catch-all, right? the, catch all, the, you know, if you, if you see, pray, you mm-hmm. if you spend time in the word, if you practice what the what the Bible teaches you and what you learn in church, and if you have a relationship with God, that these things are gonna, you know, are gonna heal, right? That's that's where healing comes from. But then we have people in in church that are there for that. Like that is why they attend church because they they're carrying this burden of of, of anxiety or, or debilitating depression or, or whatever. And they're there for that reason, but the, but it's not fixing anything. And not only is it not fixing anything, but the church itself is not a conducive environment to deal with the things that you need to deal with. There's nobody sitting down with you saying like, we have like, okay, so you're struggling in this way. So you should probably talk to a professional and try and sort wow. through that and try and develop strategies wow. and try to, and you know, it's, you know, nobody can, not a lot of people have that, right? Like we do that on the show. We're like, if you're leaving religion, if you're struggling, if you have a history of abuse, if you're dealing with depression, go see a counselor. That's a mm-hmm. really important mantra for us on the show. But it, it, church is not, they don't do that. And they claim to have an alternate answer, which isn't helpful, right? Mm-hmm. And even if they weren't 
capable of being able to help somebody in a situation like what I was in because they haven't had the mental health training or, or anything like that. Um, they could at least, you know, think beyond the, oh, well, you can just pray and be happy and say, okay, well, maybe she really does need professional help. And there are there are some churches who, yeah, who do yeah. do that. I mean, that. Right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah. real traditional churches, especially like that. And with my situation, it was it was complicated because a lot of a lot of teens had a personality or were at a level of mental health where they would just speak up and say, hey, this is what's happening. But I, I think a little bit too because I was very emotional. I was very um, much an empath, and I felt things very, very strongly for mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Um, I wasn't just able to go up to my best friend or go up to my youth pastor, and and I didn't feel safe t- telling the truth about what was happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the leadership of our youth group a lot of times were very. We talked about this on Caleb's episode. There was a huge emphasis on sarcasm, on being funny, of being like an entertainer, of, you know, all these different things that it makes sense to me of like personalities like yours wouldn't have the same benefits that I had. Right. I felt like I was invisible and like, Mm. why didn't anybody care enough to see that I was going through this? Yeah. Yeah. So we do need to take a break. Uh, when we get back, I do want to discuss with you, Ashley, about um, a tragedy hit your life early on. And I remember even when all this happened when I was younger, I did not know how to respond. I didn't know how to reach out to you. Um, it was hard. And um, I want to kind of I want to talk more about your side of it and how that felt. Uh, when we get back, we'll be right back. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> Welcome back to the life after. I have here with us, Ashley. Yes. Um, okay. The next big life event that happened, we were in late high school. Mm-hmm. Okay, because we both graduated 2004, right? Correct. Okay. Um, tell us what happened. So right after graduating high school, I went on a mission trip okay. to Miami, Florida. I was there, yes. Okay. I saw that right. look of like, were you there? I was there for sure. Right. So just getting back from that mission trip, my parents sat, me and my sister, my little sister, um, down and told us that my mom had been diagnosed with cancer. Wow. So it was sort of in that summer after graduating high school, and I was supposed to start um, my to start college at a seminary. I was actually going to major in missions. But I was really excited, and I had everything ready, and I was getting ready to, to move and live in the dorm, and it was in another state, and I was all excited um, and, and that's that's when we got the news. And it was actually a really aggressive brain tumor that she was diagnosed with. And she mm-hmm. had to have brain surgery right away. Um, and we decided that I was going to um, stay home and attend uh, college uh, at a local university um, instead of going away. And that way I could help take care of my mom while my dad was right, working. Right, right, okay. So that was, I mean, the, a life-altering event in, in more than one way. It wasn't just this emotional sort of you know, torrential downpour. It was like this also like, Oh, you had plans. Never mind. You know? Right. That, I mean, that kind of thing is always huge, but it completely changed my path and everything that I was working towards at that time. Yeah. And how long did your mom fight that cancer? So it was actually, um, a pretty long, uh, battle that she had. She went through, a um, couple different surgeries. She had chemotherapy. She had radiation. Um, 
and she was amazing. She fought through it all. Um, she ended up passing away um, uh, about two years after she was diagnosed. And how, who was there for you for that part? It was bad timing in a lot of ways. Not only, you know, when is there a good time for that, but it was at the same time that I felt like I lost all of my friends because everyone went away to college. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was staying home and I was um dealing with this um in my family and I didn't I didn't know how to deal with it um emotionally. And it you know was the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. So I I I should have been getting professional help and um I really didn't have anyone to talk to at the time. Mm-hmm. Wow. Did you start therapy around that time or is that? So I was going to um, my local college and that's when I realized that they did offer counseling for free for students. Uh-huh. And I started um, like grief counseling um, yeah. and it was two or three months before my mom passed away. Mm -hmm. And then um, I continued a a few months after her death. Um, And that actually was really helpful to me. I was really grateful for that. But Mm -hmm. then um, I couldn't get the free counseling anymore. So I had to stop. Right. right. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. So you, you went through that whole, I mean, you know, I guess, 90% 90% of that process sort of on your own. I mean, you were, were you still going to church? Was that, was that part of it? Was it, I were was, people at church aware of what was going on? How was that handled? My, my mom was active in the church. My mom and dad both attended um, church. Uh, actually, I, they didn't attend as regularly as I did. I was really into it, but they, um, they went to a Sunday school class and there were some women in my mom's Sunday school class um that would bring us meals um and sort of provide support in that way um so so there so there was there was that to to that extent um I had moved on from our youth group and was kind of sort of involved with the college group but really didn't know people very Mm -hmm. well Mm -hmm. Um, and didn't really felt like anybody knew what was going on with me other than the fact that we had this illness in the family. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if I would have known how to comfort somebody in that way with the limited knowledge. Like, as you know, Chuck said before, you know, we were taught that every answer is found in the Bible. Every answer is found in Jesus. You mm-hmm. know, the joy is one of the fruits of the spirit. So if you don't have that joy, then obviously you're not doing something right. You know what I mean? And so there really wasn't much room for appropriate grief. It was just kind of immediately trying to find, well, what is the lesson in this? How, what am I trying to learn? What is, um, how can I make this negative a positive? You know, what are the good things that I can find out of your mom passing away? You know, and, and if, yes, there's going to be some positive things through situations, but really a situation like death does not have a redeeming quality about it. It's grief. Yeah. And there's not always room for people to grieve. I think the thing that I struggled with the most was I was going through grief and I, you know, I had this deep, deep sadness around missing my mom and, having to deal with life without her. At the same time, I was only 19 years old. And because I was seen as such a good Christian, it's like all of the adults expected me to be the spiritual leader in that situation. Mm -hmm. And um, after my mom passed away, um, it was, it was especially hard. My dad had a hard time coping with it and dealing with it. Um, he sort of 
left the church for a little while and wasn't able to really be a parent to me and my sister. Um, I felt responsible. My sister was going through a horrible time. Um, she did not have any help or support from her friends in the youth group or any of the leaders at the time in the youth group. Um, and I just remember pleading with people saying, Hey, can somebody help her? Mm -hmm. Um, I was asked to, you know, stand up and be the one to give the eulogy and pray at my mom's funeral. And I sort of had to take on all these really adult responsibilities at that time. Wow. And I, I was a little bit, you know, angry that, you know, why did I have to be the one to do that? I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I felt like there could have been a lot more support. Mm -hmm. Um, especially just emotionally for, um, young girls that are trying to deal with this horrible situation. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you know, what comes to mind though is like, uh, there's this, uh, there's a lot of talk in the Bible of the early church about, you know, bearing one another's burdens, you know, uh, grieving together. If, if one member of the church is grieving, everybody's grieving. If one member rejoices, everybody rejoices. And it, it's sort of... It's it, like it, it's either, it either works or it doesn't, right? I mean, it's sort of like I read those passages and I think, okay, there are communities where this works, but it's, it's so few and far between, right? It's almost, I don't know if it's contrived or if it's just, if it, if it doesn't function or if it, uh, it but it's just, it's so rare in church for the, for in the American church, at least that's all I can comment on, I guess for when somebody is broken and grieving, depressed, uh, if they don't fit that, that happy mold, that, that happy ending story is sort of what you're talking about, Brady. They don't have a, a place in the church a lot of times, or there's like, okay, well, we'll give them, you know, this allotted period of time, but like, I don't know if we can fit them in, you know, it, it's, it doesn't fit into the, the big scheme. Right. And I feel like that's sort of the, the problem here. You know, it, it's, if the Holy spirit is what sort of drives people to, um, sort of unifies the church. Right. I mean, like mm -hmm. literally we're supposed to be a body, you know, in this, in this almost literal sense of like, we're all sort of connected in our right, in our emotions right. and in our spirituality and in our journeys, but we're not. I mean, you just don't see that in church. You see the the you know what you see in in the culture at large, which is the hardest people to deal with are just on the outside, and then the people that make everybody feel happy and secure and and comfortable are are in the inner circle, and that's and we don't really know what to do with somebody who's struggling with depression and anxiety or somebody who's whose parents passed and they're 19 and don't have any body right you know and it's not a, it's not really a criticism so much of the people in the church for not knowing how to handle it because that's all of us it's a criticism of the system that is supposed to that's supposed to be this healing thing this theologically this is how it works. This is how we all, if we all unite under Christ, if we all worship, if we all pray, if we all are in one accord and, and together, then all of the parts will be, you know, taken care of, mm. right? Yeah. Like a sparrow, you know, that doesn't neither weeps nor, or reaps nor so like a sparrow that neither <laughs> reaps nor sows, but you know, has You've been food. quoting a lot oh, of scriptures. I have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, that's what, this is what I'm, it's a system that I'm criticizing. I have to, you know, like yeah. you gotta cite it, you know, <laughs> for me, that was why I decided to stop attending um, that church and to search for a different church just because um, again, uh, it was a reoccurring theme. I felt that, wow, this is supposed to be my family. These are supposed to be the people that love and accept me the most. And it really feels like um, no one really cares that my family is going through this. Mm -hmm. What was your next step after this? Because that's where my history and yours gets a little fuzzy. 
Because we had the times where we were together growing up in church. Then there was the fuzzy period. And then we ended up at our last churches together uh, in a weird convoluted way. So kind of what what was that, that gap, the bridge between those two? I know you were involved in like college... Um, campus crusade for christ through your college and right um yeah through this whole period um i was still volunteering a lot i mm-hmm. was still um involved with campus crusade um i started um trying different churches there was um another church in the area that had a hispanic ministry and i was really into hispanic culture and like Um, I was a Spanish major um, for my bachelor's. Uh, I had gone on a lot of trips to Mexico. um, So that was kind of something I was really, really into. I was volunteer teaching English. um, And so I decided to start volunteering and helping and attending in the Hispanic ministry. Okay. Okay. And yeah, okay. And that kind of takes us to a different, a totally different part of your story, but it's related, but it's not related, but it's totally different. Uh, that brings up a whole different set of of issues, right? Um, so we're gonna take a break before we get into that because uh, it's a uh, it's a doozy. It's a doozy. All right, we'll be back. Extra, extra! Read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. Ba-dum, bum so I'd just like to welcome back all of our listeners to this next segment on The Life After. Yeah! That was good. That was, that was way cool. better than we usually do. Okay, so you, uh, so you're dealing with this tragedy. Your mom's passed away, right? Um, you are you. You're looking for you start looking for a different church because you're not getting. Uh, you're not being. You knew something was missing, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. Your 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 personal problems, the things that you're concerned with, aren't being addressed at the church you're a part of. So you go to a different church. You start working in this Hispanic ministry. And this is where you meet your future husband. That's right. Slash ex-husband. I was very Spoiler young. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still like 19, 20 years old. And right. at this point, very, very depressed. Um, again, don't have any of my close friends who are actually living at home anywhere close. Um, it was a really hard time for me. Yeah. Um, I had also not had any previous relationships before. I had not had a boyfriend before okay. this time. Yeah, yeah. And it was a few months after my mom passed away that um, one of the guys that came to the English class to learn English and I was helping teaching um, asked me out on a date. And... That's how I got involved. And you were in a yeah. vulnerable time. Right. Um, I was pretty much just looking for anybody who was willing to talk to me and give me any kind of emotional support mm-hmm. at that mm-hmm. point. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we don't need to get into only what you're comfortable with, but would you mind kind of describing your marriage a little bit and just kind of how that worked out? Or, that or just relationship. that relationship in general? Because there's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of like, little things there are a lot of things that happen there right it's 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 a crazy story it's really uh kind of hard to explain but yes um i i did um meet this guy and who was very attentive to me um very romantic telling me how beautiful i was how much he loved me spending you know all of his time with me um and you know i really I really needed some kind of support at that time. And I think that was a big reason um, why I was really drawn to that. Um, We only dated for a short time. Um, It was only probably about six or seven months that we were actually dating. Mm -hmm. 
Um, another part of the story is that he uh, is from Mexico, and he was living and working in Missouri, and he was undocumented. Um, and during the time that we were dating, he actually um, got pulled over and got arrested and was going to get deported. Okay. Um, so there was all these things that were happening at the same time. Yeah. I was very much in love with him and mm-hmm. believed that he was in love with me. Mm-hmm. I completely fell for every lie that he ever told me. Mm. Um, and it didn't take very long until he proposed to me and I decided to get married. Can I, can I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. And I don't want to read into too much, but I kind of get a sense that there's obviously a lot of regret in that situation. Um, I mean, Chuck and I have both been through divorces. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that no, nobody in their right mind is judging you. They shouldn't, Right. I mean, because it feels that way, because it feels like, you know, we made a big mistake with certain times in our lives, and we think, oh my God, like, I think so low of myself for what I did that other people are going to feel the same way. Mm-hmm. But I listened to your story, and I it makes sense. You you needed You needed somebody, and you weren't getting that before, and you did get that, and it seemed like something new and something that you needed. Um. Yeah, you, you know, there's there's a lot of, I guess, guilt and yeah. shame because you know that, like, looking back, you're like, what was I thinking? Mm-hmm. Like, that is such a crazy thing to do at the time. Um, and I think that I'm just used to being on the defensive just because mm-hmm. I have gotten so many people at that time, um, even a, a lot of judgment, judgment for... Um, being involved with somebody who was not a really good Christian in the church, being involved with somebody who was not white. Um, I have some very conservative family members who were upset about it. Um, all this stuff was happening. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, a lot of people, you know, ask me, what, what were you thinking? Why would you, why would you do that? Yeah. So that's, right. that's something that, you know, it's, I've had to deal with that, sort of guilt and shame that's kind of surrounding that. So what kind of was like the next step after that? I mean, you were, he was undocumented. You guys ended up getting married. Right. Um, and then that made it so he could stay here as well. No. It's kind of like a side, no, that's not how that worked. How does he, that work? We, as soon as we were married, we started the application process so that he could become a citizen. Mm-hmm. Um, part of that meant that I had to move to Mexico. Oh, yes. While okay. that was going on. I so remember when this happened. Uh, okay. After I was married, um, I moved um, to Mexico and I ended up living in Mexico for four years. Wow. And, um, that's a long time. Um, he never um, actually did uh, get his um, visa approved. Okay. Really? Our, okay. Our case was denied. And so it wasn't like an automatically, oh, they're married. So was He's this a American situation now. where you, uh, you were. You moved to Mexico thinking, oh, we'll be here for six months, we'll be here for a year, oh, we'll definitely. be here for two years, we'll definitely. be here for three years. And it just kept dragging on. We were just waiting and you, waiting and homesick. paying more and more money. I was by myself yeah. in another country. Yes. Yeah, it was yeah. a very difficult situation. Tell us about Mexico. So a lot of people ask me, oh, you lived in Mexico. That must have been so fun, right? Awesome. Yeah. Cancun. No, I I actually lived on a a border town um, that was not touristy and it was in the middle of the desert and it was, it was pretty rough. Yeah. Um, It was kind of like camping for four years Uh where you don't have hot water. um, Not a lot of air conditioning. We had one little window unit in our bedroom. Um, So just practical things like that. There wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't real safe we were in a poor neighborhood um i mean culturally i really had an eye-opening experience where i really learned to appreciate how how much we have living Uh, here yeah Mm -hmm. um for the first time in my life i 
I was living um, like the people of this culture. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I, I mean, I learned a lot about that. You got kind of street smart, I feel like. Yeah. They're You're kind of badass. You kind of had to. Yeah. Um, for sure, you had to be very, very careful so you didn't get mugged and robbed. <laughs> you had mentioned that he was undocumented, um, and you had met him through a church... Ministry. W- ministry. How was their response to him not being documented? How did they handle that situation? That was really interesting to me because I would say the main reason why I loved being in the church so much was just because I had an opportunity to help people and I wanted to volunteer. And when I started being really, really involved in the Hispanic ministry, um, I was really excited Mm -hmm. because we here were all of these people who, you know, lived in our hometown. We didn't have to go on a mission trip to Mexico (laughs) to talk to them and and hang out with them uh, and share our lives with them. They were right here and and we could bring them into the church and we could just, you know, be with them. Um, I was really actually kind of surprised at the reaction of um, sort of the Americans uh, in the church and the the way that they were very segregated from all of the Hispanics that they were kind of bringing in and ministering to, but at the same time, didn't really want to mix with. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because, okay. So later on, you okay. know, we ended up at the same church, right? Um, the, the second church, the one that ended up disfellowshipping me. Um, but they, yeah, they had a, they had a, a Hispanic uh, ministry, but it was like in the church, but it was separate from the church. Um, like different times and everything. And we didn't really mix that much. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like we had the church like sign that said, you know, this is the name of the church. This is when we meet. And then underneath it was like, oh yeah, Hispanic ministries. Are so right. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> and we would kind of come in, but then go straight to the basement, you know, and then like nobody really saw us. And it, okay. it, it was very, it was a very similar deja vu experience again because again i didn't fit in with the other americans but now it was because i was with the hispanics okay so So i was i was the weird one again this is bizarre this is how i see you i see you as somebody who (sighs) i'm not gonna get emotional you lacked a certain amount of acceptance and love growing up and i see you as somebody who in a way of helping that situation, maybe kind of like helping yourself heal, you help others and go to places where maybe they don't feel accepted. And so I see you kind of like as one who's always looking for people that were being overlooked and you made sure that they weren't being overlooked. Right. The outsiders, the outsiders, you're constantly on watch for them. And so I see that with like the Hispanic ministry and stuff, because the church we grew up in when it, we didn't have that. There was not any intercultural or any, um, inner, there there was a lot of like international missions, but it's always like, well, we'll go to you. We'll go to Mexico. We'll do this. But it comes like the the people who came into our, that really wasn't existent. Um, but I see you as somebody who kind of did that. Um, I think of that quote of, um, become the adult that you needed as a kid. And so here you are in this Hispanic mystery. You're you're in a relationship for the first time, right. maybe, right? Uh, was he your first relationship that you ever right. had? Um, and he was undocumented. And you're saying that they had kind of a mixed feelings of how they responded to that. Do any conversations that you had with people stick out in your mind or how that was kind of handled? What really stuck out to me was that even though the church was very, very willing to open their doors and and sort of accommodate and give a place um, for the Hispanics to to meet and to worship, um, they weren't actually aware that uh, almost all of the Hispanics that were attending were also undocumented, as was their um, Hispanic pastor that they brought in to preach in Spanish. Um, and in that culture, you know, that in the area where we live, that's, that's pretty normal. I mean, it happens. Yeah. Right. Right. And the mindset of 
most of the Americans that I talked to was that, oh, no, they couldn't that couldn't possibly be happening in our church, because Mm. if someone was here illegally, then that makes them a criminal and that's against the law and that's a sin. So it was almost like we're not even going to consider that a possibility. Right, right. Um, and I was shocked by, I was like, okay, so, so you think <laughs> all of these people that are coming, they're just all, you know, legal American right. immigrants. Right, right. So it's kind of like they, they wanted to get involved in, in, in ministry, but not realizing how messy it could be if you're looking at it through black and white lenses, you know, and, and it seems like it was maybe easier to ignore that or not pay attention to it, but it was everywhere around them. Can you, sorry, can you tell the story about the, about what you said about praying for people that are trying to cross? Right. So within my friends who were the Hispanics who um, were from Mexico or from Central America or from South America, um, we very much saw it as um, whenever somebody was going through horrible, dangerous, life-threatening situations in their country and they were separated from their family and they needed to come to the U.S. Um, for whatever reason that they were coming, um, we we would be, we would, you know, talk about those things whenever they asked for prayer requests and say, you know, so-and-so is um, coming to the U.S. Um, they even would relate it to you know, crossing into the promised land, you know, because God is giving them the opportunity to come here and, you know, God is with them and we're going to be praying that God brings them here and brings them safe. And when I mentioned that to some of my American friends, they were very, very uncomfortable with even the idea of, you know, praying that somebody would not die just because technically... It was breaking. It was breaking, breaking the, the law. law. So the, there's almost like a, it's like a very subtle hostility there. I mean, it's like it's not active. It's not like it's it's a it's a level of ignorance that is almost to the degree of like being uh, against, right? For me, well, I didn't agree with that at all, yeah. um, because of the way that our immigration system is set up, um, but. I remember thinking, why, why does it matter? Right. Why, why are we not loving them, you know, despite of where they were born or where they came from or what their legal status is? Why, mm. why is that such a big deal? Yeah. And, and it makes sense if you're legalistic and there's the verse about, you know, following the laws of the land you know, then you have to look at everything through this black and white lens of yeah, well, but either you you're have to do everything right. You have to right butt that up to... against dozens of verses about how to treat sojourners or refugees or aliens or whatever their you know whatever the Hebrew word for it was. Right, right. You can't the law of the land. I mean, like you know, it's it's pretty that's pretty pretty problematic to me to like, and this is sort of what I what I mean is like we have this. Christian political force that is it's pretty outspokenly the American right tends to be anti-immigration. And yet we have this, the Bible that the whole religion is based on. That's very, very pro refugee. Right. Yeah. And it's, how do you justify those two? You know, I, well, I think that in, and this uh, sort of, this is like the hypocrisy that we're, you know, that we're having to deal with politically. I think that I think a lot of people want to view it as, well, back then it wouldn't be illegal to go into from one country to another or to be a soldier or whatever. But I don't think that historically that's always the case. I think that no. any way you look at it, what I see happening is people are wanting all of these things to kind of fit in perfectly. But what you realized, Ashley, with working with, these people who came from Mexico or whatever, who might not be documented, life is not black and white. Mm-hmm. It's not going to fit these perfect filters and yeah. not everything's just going to work out perfectly. Life is messy and we're there to pick it up and to put it together of however we can. You 
erred on the side of compassion and empathy and saying, well, I don't care who these people are, what their motivation is, or if they're going to be breaking a law, you want them to be safe and you want them to be happy and not in dangerous situations. Um, But it sounds like with some of the church experience that we've had in the past, they wanted to side on the side of, well, we're, well, we don't know anything of it the illegal going on in our church. Mm-hmm. We don't know about these. You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. they they were more concerned with saving. I I'm going to say this. I'm not going to have you say this. I think they were more concerned about saving their own butts, of um of not just legally but also legalistically. Yeah. Um. I think that those were two of the motivations that may have led them to the, take the viewpoint that they had. Yeah, it was very frustrating, and like you mentioned, the hypocrisy of it because. You know, the Bible doesn't talk about one sin being worse than another, Mm -hmm. but yet somehow there are certain sins that are Mm -hmm. more acceptable than others because people don't make a big deal out of it. So So I I got the perspective definitely from the people who are from that culture who are within an American church. You got to see it a little bit, even though you're a white person. Right. So I feel like your journey so far, everything that you shared with us is you trying to find a a comfortable place, right? You're looking for somebody who who understands what what you're feeling. You're looking for somebody who is going to be there for you. You're looking for somebody who is um, whether it's you know your your church joining youth group, whether it's your marriage while you're while you're grieving, um, and. It, it, and you're you're going to these great lengths. You've literally moved to another country to find this, right? And you're struggling, but you didn't find that in your marriage. That was not where it was. No, I thought that moving to Mexico was going to be starting over and that it was going to be a good experience um, with my then um, new husband, Um it was good in that I got pretty fluent in Spanish. Okay. So that There's was a, a plus. There you go. Um, <laughs> other than that, um, I was very, very isolated. Mm. I now didn't have any support. I didn't have friends or family. They all lived um, in Missouri and I was in Mexico. I, again, started looking for a church. And I attended a lot of different churches while I was in Mexico. Um, Some of them were Protestant. Some of them were Catholic. Some of them were sort of American run by missionaries. Um, And I sort of joined with them. And then I would help as the American churches came down and did their mission trips um, to the Mexican churches. Um, I was still very active. I was still volunteering. I was still trying Mm -hmm. to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and be a good Christian. Um, you are and, such a resilient human. Can I just, I mean, like, I would have given up a long time ago. Like, volunteering and th- none of that. Like, no. Like, this, that's incredible. I'm sorry that I interrupted you. I just want to say that. Thank you. Uh, I was doing that because I felt so empty inside mm. and so broken and so sad and depressed. And, um, <sighs> This is this is the difficult part is that on top of being in Mexico my marriage was falling apart mm. pretty much right away within the first year the first 2 years um I realized that my husband was an alcoholic mm. um he said that he believed in God and that he was Catholic um uh, but he didn't want to attend church with me. Um, he pretty much drastically changed. And this is a pattern for men who are like him, who are predators and who um, see that mm-hmm. vulnerability and they mm-hmm. see um, that there's an opening to go in and take an advantage and I was very much taken advantage and manipulated Mm -hmm. um like I said I was isolated um financially I was um paying for everything and he had complete control of 
the financial financial situation, and I lost a lot of money. Wow. Um, he, when he was drinking, he was very abusive. Um, he was emotionally abusive. He would scream and yell at me, and he would force me to have sex even if I didn't want to. And he was physically abusive as well. I'm but so sorry. that not as much. It was more emotional and I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't, I was in denial. I think just trying to process everything that was going on and it actually didn't even occur to me that it was abuse. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. I was just very, very depressed and just sad all the time and just praying and praying and going to church and trying to find out what I could do to fix the situation and to help him. Because again, I had this tendency to want to help people and fix people. And so I believed that if I was kind and loving enough to him, that I could fix him too. Yeah, Yeah. Which is a very common theme for these type of relationships. Right, right. I mean, you were going through to church while this stuff was happening. That's right. Were you able to find help or advice or anything from your communities there? Part of the problem was that I felt guilty and ashamed. And I didn't feel safe opening up and telling the whole truth, even to my family, even to my sister, even to my closest friends of everything that was happening, the the severity of how much mm. was happening. Um, I was afraid of judgment and afraid of rejection. Um, I, I did meet um, a few people who kind of saw and was like, you know, maybe this isn't good for you. Um, people who have been through divorce mm. and like kind of tried to warn me, but I didn't feel like I had any answers or any real good advice of what to do or where to turn. Okay. Basically. Um, it was kind of like, well, he's horrible. Leave him, get out. Like as if it was it's as easy as, yeah. Snapping your fingers. Why did you feel guilty? I felt guilty for allowing myself to get so deep into a situation where someone else was taking advantage of me and I knew it. Um, My husband was also cheating on me and along with the emotional abuse And I felt that I should have prevented it. Wow. What could you have done? Well, that's the thing. Now looking back, I know that I wasn't in a place where I was emotionally mature enough or emotionally healthy enough to be able to see what was happening. Yeah. So I know that now, but the feeling that I had then was that I had to have more faith Hmm. and that I, Hmm. I mean, mean, there's more than just emotional maturity though. I mean, the situation that you were in, you're, you're cut off from the people that you knew. You know, you were you were isolated, as you said, in a different in a different country. Your family wasn't completely aware of all of this stuff either. You know, so it's more than just oh, I should have been wise to this. I mean, there were other factors in play as well that were outside of your control, and that isolation is what causes us to do things that we normally wouldn't do. Um, but we find ourselves in those situations whenever we are cut off. You know. It mm. is, and it's a, and if you are experiencing shame and guilt about something, it's incredibly hard 
to find that courage to reach out to someone and say, mm-hmm. hey, this is what's happening. I need help. Well, and it's even harder to flip-flop that shame and guilt into this is not my fault, mm-hmm. right? Because we are, it's such, shame is such a powerful force, right? It, it, it's so hard to go from this is what I believe is right and I'm, breaking that and that those are the that's the reason for my problems to no none of this is my fault like that's that feels when you're especially when you're in the faith or when you're you have very deeply entrenched beliefs that is uh it's very it sounds flippant it sounds disregarding right to be like mm-hmm. oh well you know what actually none of this is my fault that sounds like you're just giving up right like you're you're not fighting the good fight right but you're, oh God, you have to. Right. From a very young age, you are taught and your Christian values are that if you sin against God, uh, yes, he will forgive you, but there are consequences yeah. to that. Yeah. And so I I felt very much so that this was happening for a reason. I must have done something wrong. Oh, it was Ashley. the consequence of my actions. But nobody deserves that. Right, exactly. Yeah. When did you realize that that there was something you got out? I mean, there's, there's, it, this isn't just you're not stuck, you know, right now into this. Like, how did you? What was kind of the moment where you realized? Well, here's the thing: I was married for eight years. Wow, That's a long time. I didn't yes. realize it was that long. And you, you, you stayed married. Right. You believed that leaving this man would have been doing something wrong. After the first few years, I remember thinking to myself, this is not going to get better. I'm not going to be able to change him. This is how it's always going to be. And then I was faced with, well, divorce is sin. Yeah. So I have to do everything I can to try not to get a divorce. Wow. And that was my mindset probably for the last four or five years of the marriage. Wow. wow. That's right. a long time. Right. And then there were some Christians who were telling me to preserve the marriage and not get a divorce. It's almost mm-hmm. like no matter what happens, don't get divorced. Wow. So, were they aware like, of any abuse or anything that was happening when they said that? Uh, I think to different levels. I was really good at hiding Mm -hmm. that part of my life. Um, So people never actually knew what was really going on with me. Um, But there are some people that it it doesn't, you know, it doesn't doesn't even matter. matter. Yeah, you're just supposed to trust God and stay in the marriage and not get divorced. It was, it was really, it was really a, a struggle for me to kind of just grasp even the idea of getting out. Wow. I don't think that I need to say that I very severely disagree with that belief. <laughs> right. That's ridiculous. I like, mean, that is painfully yeah. ridiculous, but it's, but it's in there, right? It's, it's something that we're taught from a very young age. It's in the Bible. God hates divorce. It's very difficult. It, it, biblically, abuse is not a means for divorce. Infidelity is. But you still, God hates divorce. It all goes back to that, right? But if you are suffering, if you are being abused, if you're being disregarded, if you're not being treated like a human, you have that right. That is your human right, human right yeah. to leave that relationship 100%. And it is ridiculous to say otherwise. We need to take a break. Um, when we get back, we're going to talk about how Ashley recovered from all of this and how she is uh, thriving now as a human, doing well. We'll be back. What is that? I'm calling it a... It's a new letter I've been working on. You're right, Chuck. We've always had 26, but I think we could really benefit from having 27. Oh, Brady, I asked you to make a newsletter, not a new letter. Oh. 
Like we could put a link on our website and have listeners sign up to receive an email newsletter whenever we have updates. Exactly like that. Yeah, okay, I, I could get that ready by the time we release this. Sounds great. Sign up for the newsletter at thelifeafter.org. Welcome back to Life After. Uh, where we left off with Ashley um, is how did you get out of your domestic abuse situation? So I finally reached a point where I was in Mexico. I was depressed. I was actually considering self-harm and cutting myself. And I remember just being alone and crying all the time. And I was in that place where I finally felt that I had to do something. And I made the decision to um, pack up my car and take my cat and drive back to Missouri. And I separated from my husband and I came back and I had to start all over again and start making a life for myself. Um, and actually this, it's always very painful process going through divorce. Yeah. Um, my divorce was very messy. It was very complicated. Um, he ended up um, back in the same place where I was. And he was actually threatening me and stalking me. And he would slash my tires and break into my house. Oh, my God. And at one point, he was um, spreading rumors about me to all of my friends um, and people at church and, and family and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, it was, it was insane. Did people believe these rumors? Um, yeah, because he would take pictures um, of like empty alcohol bottles and then like send them and say, Ashley's no. crazy and she's drinking and she's you? sleeping around and she's, you know, all this wow. crazy stuff. Yeah. And then I would get people who would uh, oh contact me and be like, Ashley, what's going on? We heard that all this stuff was happening. And I was like, this is a toxic person. He is trying to get back at me because yeah. I left him. Yeah. Do not talk to him. Do not contact right. him. So did I, you get the benefit of the doubt from these people? I mean, a lot of my close friends were supportive. Um, they knew that I was doing the right thing by leaving him. Good. But good. there there were, you know, people in the church who it just blew my mind that they would even listen to him. Um, so all this stuff was going on. I couldn't get a restraining order because... He's still undocumented. <laughs> he, oh, he was still wow. undocumented at that time. So um, you actually have to serve papers to, you know, a place of employment and be able to track him down. And if you can't serve him, you can't get a restraining order. Anyway, um, it was a very long, hard process to do the divorce. But through this time, you're you're finally making decisions that benefit you. And not in a selfish way, but in a way that you allowed yourself to be a person. Right. Everything felt like it was spiraling out of control. Yeah. As soon as I made that decision to leave, um, I was trying to work and hold down a job. Yeah. I was trying to go back to school. I was trying to do all these different things. And because I, he was harassing me and he wasn't letting me get the divorce, it was so hard. I, um, I remember one day my boss just told me, I'm sending you to the employee assistance program and you have to go in and you have to get counseling. Okay. And so he actually, you know, sent me to talk to somebody who then referred me to um, a place where they offer therapy to survivors of domestic violence. Yeah, okay. And I didn't even, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to seek that kind of help. Okay. So I, I didn't, feel that I was in that category. I was like, what? Am I in the right place? What are you uh, talking about? Why mm. why are you sending me here? Right. Um and it wasn't until I started going there and I started talking 
um, to my therapist um, that I realized, yes, this is what happened to me. This is my life. Uh, when an abuser comes in and is manipulative and is gaslighting you and mm. is isolating you and making you feel like shit all the time and feel like it's your fault and all of these things are happening, um, that's what it was. Yeah. That's mm. abusive and that's not something that you should ever have to you should ever have to stand for. How hard is it, how hard was it for you specifically to kind of come to that that place of realizing, you know, I've, I've always grown up hearing stories about domestic abuse. I've always heard, you know, there's different things, but that's actually me and who I am. You know that I've gone through that. I, as I, I've imagined that's got to be so hard because it's a shame that you were talking about before. And is it normal for people to really have a hard time Admitting that to themselves? Is that a common thing? It's such a struggle. And I'm able to understand because it's part of my story because it happened to me. But so many people are like, well, obviously, if somebody is treating you bad, you you just leave. You get out. Yeah. You don't let people treat you like that. Like, that's common sense. It's almost like, why did it never occur to you to just get up and leave? Yeah. Well, when you're in that situation... Of course it occurs to you, you know, every single day you're wishing that that wasn't your life. Yeah. You're wishing that you could move on, that you could get out of it. Um, Let me ask you this. Do you, do you think that being brought up with, cause it, you know, in the notes you had mentioned that one of the things that you really related to within Christianity was to turn the other cheek. Do you feel that sometimes that belief system may, that one specific thing of turning the other cheek may kind of cause some people to stay in situations longer than they should? Because I think that we kind of accept that as a part of, well, this is our belief system. This is our religion. I think that was a part of it. I think I was holding on to that. I think another part of it is that I've always been a very empathetic person. Um, I've always been deeply emotional, almost to the point where you start overthinking things mm -hmm. and those thoughts that I would dwell on that, well, maybe it is me, maybe there's something I can do. It's almost to the point where it, it was just too much. But at the same time, I know that this happens um, outside of people who have had religious, religious backgrounds. Religious backgrounds, yeah. There, right. there are so many people who feel trapped, and it doesn't even have to be a marriage, you know, just um, a relationship with their boyfriend mm -hmm. or girlfriend. Um, and they, you know, they get this feeling, I'm not happy, this is, this is not the way it should be, and, you know, this... You know, you're kind of like, well, is it abuse? Is it not? I'm not really sure. You know, but if mm -hmm. you're starting to think those things, it's because there's warning signs. Mm -hmm. It's because you're getting these messages that like, okay, something's wrong here. Mm -hmm. And so for people like that, you, you feel hopelessness, but it's so important to remember that you are strong enough and that you do have the courage in you yeah. that when that time comes and you need to make that decision, you will be able to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I felt. And I just kind of knew <laughs> that that was my time and that's what yeah. I had to do. And so I left and it wasn't automatically all better all of a sudden. Right, right. It took a long time. Long time, yeah. <laughs> right. Was there a moment where you felt like you sort of like reached the surface and were breathing for the first time? Was there, or was it like a... Uh, was it like a more gradual sort of like, okay, things are getting better? It was when I started doing things for myself. Yeah. I booked a trip to Spain with my sister. Cool. And then another trip to Puerto Rico. And I started yeah. traveling again because that's something I've always loved. Mm -hmm. And I love learning about other cultures and mm -hmm. the Spanish language and things like that. 
So I started doing that. I started volunteering again and teaching again. Um, I (laughs) made a very conscious decision to go outside of my comfort zone and do something that I could never, ever imagine myself doing before that point. And this is so, like, (laughs) anti-Baptist. Oh, no. The thing that I decided that I wanted to do was go to salsa dancing classes. Oh, yeah. And learn how to salsa dance. Oh, yeah. Look out, Footloose. Right. So that was definitely like a turning point for me because I'd never even dreamed that that was something that I was capable of doing. So how so you you're you're mentioning that you're making these friends outside of your social circles like outside of your church circles. How different were those friendships for you now that you're meeting people from different that didn't have the same didn't live within the same dome or the same bubble that you and I were brought up in. Right. It was so beneficial to me. It w- it was so much healthier. At this point, I ended up um when I had come back, I was again trying to attend a church for a while. I was attending a Hispanic church, um, and that that didn't really work out. I wasn't getting a lot of support during the divorce. Um, plus, my ex husband knew that I was going to be there every Sunday, mm-hmm. so that was kind oh, wow. of a problem. Yeah, yeah. So I I just um, ended up spending more time. Um, in the new social circles with the new context that I had been making and, and meeting these people. And it was a little bit difficult at first because I'm not very comfortable <laughs> making new friends and meeting new people. And I feel kind of awkward and, and on the outside. But then after spending a certain amount of time um, going to bars and going to clubs that have salsa music, um, I started meeting wonderful people who were so welcoming and accepting and really didn't care about any of the shit that I've been through in my life. Wow. Yeah. And they were just there to be friends with me. And I was having so much fun just being myself. That's awesome. Right. God, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, there's one time, you know, since we've kind of reconnected, we've gotten lunch a couple of times. And there's a story that you told me that I thought was really interesting. And that was when you've kind of reconnected with some of your friends that did, that are still very religious. Right. Um, how do they treat you now that you've kind of gone your own way and kind of forged through your own jungle? Right. So I am still in contact with um a lot of my friends um even even friends from my past from the very conservative um church and i do have um a close group of friends that are very supportive of me um and even though they're still attending church and i'm not they um they still want to hang out with me. They still want to love me and spend time with me as a friend. Yes, so I'm great. very thankful to have that. Um, I've kind of noticed that there have been other people who are starting to view me differently. Um, now that I've, you know, I'm divorced now, I'm hanging out in different places and I'm not in a church every Sunday morning. Um, and I have had some of those close friendships become a little bit strained and had to distance myself a little bit because of that. From from my experience for a while, there's some friends that when I speak to them, I would say more with my family than I would friends, honestly. It's more than I'm a project of trying to get me to come back. You know, and it's not that I'm able to have a person to person relationship or friendship with them. It's more of a well, you know, we're, we're praying for you. Right. And even though you're out praying wandering, you and yeah, we'll we pray that God that brings you back. God will call and, you back. Yeah. And I think that's kind of dehumanizing sometimes because it feels like I'm more of, you know, a project. I'm, I'm just, they're just there in hopes that I change instead of in hopes of getting to know who I really am now, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that I think that's a hard thing to kind of see a friendship turn into a 
evangelism opportunity. Right. Uh, to kind of see it kind of degrade itself in that way. But Right. In some ways it's like I I appreciate the concern cuz I know that you're feeling concern for me, but at the same time why can't we just hang out and be friends and spend time together? So um I want to double back just a little bit. I want to go back just a hair cuz I think this is important. We we've we've talked a lot about the issue of domestic abuse, about uh, depression and anxiety. Um, in this episode. And I just want to like anybody that's listening, we can't underemphasize this, right? How, how long were you in therapy for the, the like post divorce? Are you still in therapy? I still am. Um, and how long has that therapy. been? Give or take. So it's been two years since I started the divorce process. Yeah. And so that was when I first started Getting therapy. Awesome. Is therapy for is it is it for crazy people? <laughs> no. It's for it's for anybody <laughs> that's struggling with literally anything. Right. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have that validation of someone who is there to listen to you and to give you resources, to give you information, and you can connect with other people. There's all kinds of different therapy and you kind of have to find out what works for you. But that was definitely something that I needed, and I feel very grateful that I have a wonderful, wonderful therapist who has helped me so much in dealing through all this and in realizing how much I've gone through and how much I've changed and how I'm not the same person that I used to be. Yeah, yeah. That's and there's huge. so much uh, life in that. Right. Right. Pride, personal fulfillment in realizing that you've gone for the, you're, you're moving, you're moving forward and you're growing and you're healing and you're helping yourself. For the first time, I'm not experiencing depression. Yes. <laughs> and being right. stuck in those emotions that are so powerful, but so negative that there's, you feel like there's nothing you can do about it. And I don't feel that way anymore. It's amazing. That is amazing. And you're so we we did this episode this week because we had to, right? Because you're about to move to another country, right? Not I to, not to marry some shithead, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, much better reason. Um, I through this process of sort of figuring out who I am and and what I want to do and I've been healing and now I'm in an, a place emotionally where I can actually move forward. And, um, I've quit my very unfulfilling office job to be able to pursue my dream of teaching English. And in 12 days, I'm going to move to Ecuador awesome. where I'm going to teach English and I am going to go out salsa dancing and yes. I am going to really kind of start this journey of, Figuring out who I am and what I want. Beautiful. Do you do you feel at all that your journey of figuring out who you are and following your bliss, doing the things that are important to you, right now, do you feel selfish about it? I don't feel that it's selfish. Um, I don't either. No, I don't. And part of who I am, I recognize that, you know, I want to help people. I still want to help people. I still want to volunteer. Um, That's always going to be you. Right. Right. I'm really excited about the opportunities that I'm going to have being in Ecuador and being able to volunteer. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think just because you're passionate about something and you're doing what you want to do that that makes it selfish. Ten years ago, if I would have asked you, do you think that the actions you're doing now would seem selfish do you think they would have been like just in your mind 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I was afraid of thinking of myself before anyone else. Hmm. That was like the worst possible thing is that I was being selfish. And so I was basically putting myself through all of this suffering 
because I didn't want to do what's best for me. Wow. I think I was the same way. I think I was the same way. I am so happy to see you thriving, to being able to help others out of a place of confidence and out of self-discovery. Um, I'm excited to hear about what you're going to do in Ecuador and the lives you're going to touch and the lives are going to touch you and just <laughs> finding your place and doing what makes you happy. I'm very excited. I love it. Thanks everybody for listening. This has been another episode of the life after Ashley. Thank you for thank you so much sharing all of that. Yeah. I'm glad we got you in before it you was, had to move. Yeah. It was so much <laughs> and you were so honest in, in, in articulate and, um, and just unapologetic about your story and it was beautiful and I really think that it matters. Big time. Uh, thank sharing you for sharing with us. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm Chuck Parson. I'm Brady Harden. And this is The Life After. Thank you.